Okay, so in theaters right now, two very different animated films. There's a new Spider-Man, which is doing amazing. And then there's Elemental, the new movie from Pixar, not doing so amazing. But what's interesting about these two movies is that they tell us something about where animation is at right now. Today on the show, the state of animation. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. And listen, we've been around as a show for a few months, right? There's like a habit that I get into where I tell you a personal story about how I relate to the topic we're talking to. And here's the thing about animation. If we were going to do that, I'd tell you that my go-to cry movie is Pixar's, Pixar's Coco. That's the movie that I turn to to go, this movie makes me cry. It moves me every time. And I would want to spend a lot of time talking about it. But I can't do that because actually the place to start this conversation is way more recent. The right place to start it is with director Guillermo del Toro. This is a guy who has blown people's minds with the films that he's made. He won his second Oscar this year, this one for Best animated feature for Pinocchio. And what's interesting to me is that Guillermo made headlines saying, you know what, he just, he wants to spend most of his time now focusing on animated movies. He also had some scathing things to say about today's animated movies. He feels they're not adventurous. He feels they're often creatively lazy. Like, one of the things that he complained about is that, you know, when these animated movies right now want to show emotions on screen, he said, quote, If I see a character raising his effing eyebrow or crossing his arms, having a sassy pose, oh, I hate that shit. Why does everyone act as if they're in a sitcom? Emphasis mine. All of this is happening against the backdrop of two new movies, Spider-Man and Elemental. So... Around the commotion table, we have a couple of people who spend a lot of time thinking about animation. With me, Corey Atad, he's a culture writer in Toronto, and Petrana Radulovic, she covers animation for Polygon. Petrana, Corey, welcome to commotion. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for having us. I'm so excited about this. This is going to be a good time. Corey, I think you got to be a little more on mic. Sure. Yeah. You, I, I, like, I like the way you're leaning. You're like a bit laid back. I love to see it. Love to see it. Okay. So I kind of only scratched the surface of all the criticism that Guillermo had to say about animation. But let's just get into his beef with how animated movies right now feel a bit like a sitcom. He doesn't say Disney or Pixar, but this feels like a pretty direct hit at that. Petron, is that how you saw it? Well, um, I am someone who's very passionate about Disney, and because of that, I'm very hyper aware of Disney Pixar faults. And that Mm. being said, I definitely saw it as very targeted against the Disney Pixar monolith. Yeah. Corey, what about you? What was your read on this? Yeah, I mean, it sounded like that. Maybe a little bit of a hit at DreamWorks, too. I I mean, DreamWorks kind of invented this sort of raised eyebrow situation thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. But you know what? I think like for the past, what, million years, maybe 20 years or so, the third weekend of June has been known as the Pixar weekend, right? It's (laughs) It's the weekend where all the big Pixar movies drop. Elemental comes out. It is a movie that does not do particularly well. But there has been something about the the the, the animated films as co-opted into being basically kids' entertainment. And I want to get back to Elemental in just a moment. But let's just talk about how we got to this moment of viewing animated films as only products for kids, Corey. I mean, it basically starts from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, before we even had animated features, it was animated shorts. Um, and in, certainly in North America, that was defined first primarily by Walt Disney. There were other people, but Walt yeah. Disney kind of created the Silly Symphony shorts. And and um, and then from there, the first feature animated film in North America was uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And, yeah. you know, so it was all just family films going right. from there. Yeah. And, uh, Petrano, this helps explain why animation is treated as a genre, right, in in mm-hmm. North America, whereas lots of other places might view it as a medium onto itself. What's going on internationally with animation right now? Well, I feel like the biggest, most obvious difference is that international animation isn't as restricted style-wise. So in North mm. America, at this point, you have this very standardized CG look, and it's pretty unanimous across studios, even though you're seeing some break out of that. But um, And you rarely see traditional animation um, but it's very alive around the world and taken in new directions. You'll have studios like Cartoon Saloon in Ireland that are creating these movies with a gorgeous folklore-inspired look to them. But beyond that, because they're not as restricted by this Disney family-friendly fair, mm. international animation also tackles stories that deal more overtly with mature themes and also center around older characters. Right. So it's not like raunchy Family Guy-esque stuff, but stuff that just deals with like 
a different set of problems. So they're not full of quips and like one-liners and whatnot. I, I do love quips and one-liners. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people. Corey, Corey, what's your read on what's going on internationally um, with animation? I mean, yeah, that basically sounds right to me. And, and of course, the biggest producer would uh, of in, uh, of animation internationally would be uh, Japan. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they do the, plenty of family fare as well, but a lot of it is very mature, very clearly intended for adults. So if you're just joining us, my name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and you're listening to Commotion. Corey Atad and Petano Radulovic are here, and we're talking about animation after Guillermo del Toro said some pretty scathing things about what's happening in the art form right now. So I want to talk about his comments in the context of these two movies that are out in theaters right now. Pixar's got this new movie, Elemental. It had the worst opening ever for a Pixar movie. It's being called a flop. But also the number one film right now is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. That's getting a lot of love from audiences, getting a lot of love from critics as well about how different it looks. Corey, I saw Spider-Man um, Across the Spider-Verse and when I was watching it, I was like, my eyes are clocking that something different is happening than the re regular animated movies that I see. But I don't have the language for it. What am I looking at? Uh, I mean, Across the Spider-Verse and, and the previous film in the series, Into yeah. the Spider-Verse, uh, really, they weren't the first, but they really kind of brought to the fore this idea of combining um, CGI, mm -hmm. 3D animation with 2D animation. In many cases, literally having artists draw over computer animated um, models and things like that. Uh, there's a lot more going on stylistically in, in those films. Yeah. But that's kind of the primary thing is that it feels like a, like a oddly kind of shaped – Thing, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like this is this is the thing that my eyes are reacting to because I'm watching. I'm like, I've been used to a certain kind of sort of CGI animation for the past like ten, fifteen years or so, and this felt like a sort of a clean break from that. If that makes sense. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but Toronto, the other film in theaters right now is Elemental. It, uh, yikes! It had the worst opening for a Pixar <laughs> film. It's not doing great at the box office. Maybe in the context of what we've been talking about, is this a surprise to you? I feel like Pixar has kind of fallen into a formula um, and it, it's something that was super groundbreaking 20 years ago when Pixar first blew onto s the scene. But to sum up the formula, I'm going to quote this old meme that went around when Inside Out came out and that is Pixar movies are what if toys had feelings? What if cars had feelings? What if robots had feelings? What if feelings had feelings? And now you <laughs> see what if water and fire had feelings? And in the beginning, I think this opened up like really cool world building. Yeah. I think that um, they come up with these incredibly imaginative concepts and that often require super duper technological advancements to achieve them. Like the look of the water in this film is like really, really cool, but yeah. that only carries the story so far. Yeah. Um, it looks stunning, but I don't know if a cool concept can act, can like totally like tie it up together. I, Corey, when I think about Pixar, I think to like to me, Pixar is a brand that people have a really like deeply emotional relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned earlier that you know, like they've kind of they take the third weekend of June and they they sort of drop a big movie in that weekend every year for a really long time. You could go, you know, they have like a fifteen year streak of just never missing. You know, yeah, Toy Story, Ratatouille. Oh my God, I love Ratatouille. Um, yeah. right. Up. You know, Up is a, is a movie that is for the first 20 minutes of Up, it is a silent film about an old man dealing with grief. Yeah. It is a billion dollar movie. It's, it's like that, so they've, they've had successes where they seem to be almost like deeply unlikely. But they are kind of been on the back foot, right? Like so starting with maybe The Good Dinosaur, which is like 2015, 2016-ish. Yeah. Um, with the exception of a couple of films, um, they've kind of been dr dropping in terms of significance. Do you, do you think that's a generational thing? Do you think like I am getting attached to Pixar because I'm a millennial and younger people are like, I don't know if this is for me? No, I mean, I think it really is to do with the formula starting to seem dry at a mm. certain point. You know, at, a, at some point it, was fresh and yeah. felt fresh, including the animation itself. You know, when they did Toy Story, it was the first feature length computer animated film. Yeah. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. Every film pushed boundaries from there. You know, they're still doing technological advancements, but that only goes so far. And when all you have is the formula left, yeah. it's less appealing.
I, I I think when I think about the last three Disney movies, uh, Pixar movies, Pachana, pardon me, um, uh, when I think about Luca, for example, yeah, Luca would have not had as much success in the box office, maybe. We'll never know because it was impacted by the pandemic. That's why it came to streaming first. Um, but in the case of something like Turning Red, they decided to go with, you know, simultaneous release of theaters and streaming um, and not really, like, go really hard on, this, on the theater push. Do you think they're a little bit less confident in the ability of the Pixar brand to bring people in. It's funny that you mentioned those two because I feel like within recent years, those two have been the strongest. And I yeah. feel like if they had gone with the theatrical releases, they might have done better than like Lightyear, for instance, which is <laughs> that's right. Toy Story I, movie. I literally erased Lightyear from <laughs> yeah. my memory because yeah, I would yeah. like to forget um, that. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like uh, Luca and Turning Red, I think, were movies that kind of stepped out of that formula. And yeah. it, it does sadden me to see that they're not taking as many chances on these like atypical Pixar movies instead yeah. of the ones that kind of fit in like the mold that they've been doing. So then to go back to Guillermo del Toro, you know, one positive thing that he had to say is like the success of Spider-Verse, the success of the Super Mario uh, brother, the Super Mario brother movies um, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is coming out this summer. Is that even out yet? He, he kind of thinks that this could help change things. None of those are Disney movies or Pixar movies, which makes me wonder, Corey. You know, they need to – maybe they need to get on board. Like Disney and Pixar need to get on board. Or do they actually not need to get on board and the, all the, the future shifts of animation are going to come from outside that particular machine? Um, I mean – I think a lot will come from outside, but they'll be pushed as well. I mean, Disney itself was pushed at a certain point to switch to computer animation from hand drawn. Yeah. I imagine that they will be pushed. Yeah. yeah. Patrana, what's your read on this? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think you've seen we've seen some like bigger American studios already like embrace that, like Sony, for instance, and, and DreamWorks with the new Puss in Boots movie, which is like a total 180 from the typical Shrek style. Yeah. Um, so I think their hand will be pushed at one point because they'll even like from a from a cynical marketing money um perspective, they probably will want to cash in on the fact that these other movies are doing much, much better at this point. I'm really glad you brought up Puss in Boots because like that was a good example of me walking to the theater with like – I'm not typically a cynical person, y'all. But like I was walking <laughs> to the theater with my biggest cynic hat on like, oh, here we go. This is a thing that is just meant to extract more money out of the right? Shrek franchise. And I was genuinely blown away by this film. I was blown away by the new Puss in Boots film. I cried. I can't even tell you how many times I wept during this movie, you know. But also the animation style of that was not something that I was expecting out of DreamWorks. Right, Corey? Yeah. 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 Very painterly. Yeah. yeah. And and so th there's something about the fact that uh, if these – these forces are operating outside of the Disney and Pixar machine. At a certain point, they'll be pushed towards that. I would like to see that happen because, boy, I saw Elemental. Um, and let us not speak further of it. Uh, Corey Petrana, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thank you for having us. Corey Atad is a freelance culture writer based in Toronto. And Petrana Radulovic is an entertainment writer covering animation for Polygon. I'm Elamin Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Hey, can I tell you a story? Can I tell you the story of the summer before I moved to Toronto? I'm going to do it anyway. I don't know why I asked your permission. I came down for a visit, okay? And my wife and I were apartment hunting, and we were just wandering the streets trying to get like a feel for the place. And we stumbled upon this music festival that was happening in a tent. And out of this tent just boomed this familiar voice. It was Aretha Franklin. She was playing the Toronto Jazz Festival that year. And I'm bringing this up because it is summer, which makes it music festival season, which makes it in general music festival season. But more specifically, it is jazz festival season. Right now, there are jazz festivals happening all over Canada in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Ottawa. Halifax's jazz festival is just around the corner. But if you've ever looked at the lineup of a jazz festival – you might notice, yes, there are lots of traditional jazz and big band shows, but there are also artists playing who you might not think of as jazz. See my days are cold It's like a movie played by another star. She's a stranger. 
That was Ashanti, Vance Joy, and Christine of the Queens. Not all bands that I typically think of when I think of the word jazz. They're all playing a jazz festival in Canada this week. So how does this happen? How do artists who are fairly clearly not in the jazz family end up headlining a jazz festival? For her thoughts on this, I got my pal Garvia Bailey here. She's a former morning show host at Jazz FM, co-founder of jazzcast.ca, co-founder of the production company Media Girlfriends. Garvia, what's good? It's all good. All I, the jazz. Wow. It's all good. Are you jazzed to be here? I'm totally jazz hand- handing <laughs> right now. Here it is. I'm very excited. A delightful a delightful way to start. Okay, look, we're going to dig into all of this in a moment. we got to touch on something first, which is that a big part of these festivals are these outdoor shows, you know, and the mm-hmm. poor air quality from the wildfires has affected a lot of the performances. The Toronto mm-hmm. Jazz Festival canceled a bunch of outdoor shows yesterday and moved some acts indoors. We're hearing that the Montreal Jazz Festival is monitoring the situation. What's your reaction when you heard this news? You know, I was actually in Yorkville when um, I heard that there was – because the, Toronto, the Toronto Jazz watching, Festival is yeah. still happening. Yeah. yeah, I'm in Toronto. Yeah. And so um, so I was there and there was a band called Kokoroko who are unbelievable and they were going to be playing the big stage uh, outdoors. And then I just heard whispers that it might not happen. So oh. um, if this is an indication of the new normal, I – it just, you know, we're just going to have to pivot and yeah. figure figure it out. But for me, the live outdoor stage is just such an integral part of the experience. So hopefully um, we can figure out how how to like, I mean, this how is just going to be what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Do it safely. Are you comfortable? Everything in moderation. How comfortable yeah. are you seeing an outdoor show these days? Everything in moderation. Yeah. I think that probably I would go and, you know, it, it might not be me dancing hardcore for two hours right. Right. Uh, as the smoke, you know, swirls around me yeah. um, and not in a pyrotechnic cool way. So um, <laughs> I just I think everything in moderation. But I, I think live music is just incredible. You have to see it outdoors and live. To, to me, wherever you go, there is smoke swirling around you in a very oh, thanks, fire technical man. way. That's that's always the case. Thank okay, you. so let's get back to the big topic here. All these jazz festivals, they've got artists who don't really play jazz. What's going on here? Oh come on! Like <laughs> you know, I, I don't. I think that we have to to lean into the festival part of jazz festivals. Mm. Uh, and think about this as a coming together of people who just love excellent music so a lot of these festivals are are really thinking about jazz and their jazz festivals as and jazz itself as a cultural entity Mm. and you know like there is the musical genre but there is the cultural part of jazz there's a reason why it was called social music to begin with it's music for people to come together and gather together and just vibe and enjoy one another so there's that element of it. So that's why I think that, you know, seeing a Vance Joy or seeing a Janelle Monet or something like that as, at, at a jazz festival is just like we're all vibing. Plus, let's not kid around. These festivals need to survive, right? Mm. They need bums in seats. If Vance Joy is going to bring a whole ton of people into uh, an, uh, an environment that they might not be in, then you're opening the door to that met many more jazz fans that might not even think about the Montreal Jazz Festival. So I, I think that, you know, that's that's how these these programmers are, are thinking about this. I, I was going to say, like, these programmers must be under a fair bit of pressure from, For sure. from lots of people. So a little while back, the new director of the Montreal Jazz Festival told that the Montreal Gazette, he said, I, he wants to bring jazz music back to the festival, and then he wants to focus on, you know, emerging and established jazz musicians. Have, is that an argument you've heard before? Like this idea of like going oh. back and forth, you know, over like, this? what belongs at the festival? This is a tale as old as time. I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, it's like nonstop. And I do believe that uh, Maureen has done a really beautiful job with the Montreal Jazz Festival. Um, and he has to appease, though, those folks that are sort of the, the I don't want to call them the old guard, but there is some real like jazz attracts purists. Yeah. Like, real purists that just when you say it's a jazz festival they want to hear just pat metheny or just people that put out albums 
before 1968. Like, <laughs> that's... Yes. And if anything else comes within their purview, it's like, what are you doing? But it just so happens that those folks are the loudest. Right. So, uh, and those folks are the donors. And those folks are the people that, that really support the festival year round. So you do have to appease th- that crowd. But at the same time, Jazz is uh, is growing. It is evolving. There are so many other um, artists, and uh, y- you know, if I broke down the genres of jazz and the subgenres, we would be here all day. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's not just the purists that that should have their voices heard, but folks like uh, Mohan, he hears their voices and yeah. wants to appease them, but at the same time. He's got to he's got to put bumps in seats. So the purists are gonna the purists are gonna pure purists are gonna do yeah, the thing that they sure. do. But do you get the sense that like wider audiences in general care? Yeah, I I, I you know the idea of of caring, you know, there are those that are fatalistic right now about jazz yeah. itself. Those that think that listening to jazz means that that um, you also breathe some kind of rarefied air that other people don't sure um and like i said those people usually are the vocal majority so yes those audiences do care but general audiences look at a festival lineup and if they see a few names that look familiar they are interested along the way those folks might hear some incredible jazz like i think about glassenbury that's happening right now there are about 30 incredible jazz artists on the Glastonbury stage. You and that's one of I mean? the biggest and, no, music festivals in the world. And it's the biggest in the world. And yeah. no one's saying, oh my goodness, Glastonbury has really <laughs> turned the corner here, including jazz artists. What's happening? You know what I mean? Like, let's just embrace what's happening and and the evolution of, of music. With like a minute left, you got into a Twitter argument about all of this with someone o- over the Blue Note Jazz Festival, which has all these big jazz acts, but also has like Chance the Rapper and Mary J. Blige. Garvey, what happened? Well, you know, I just like to jump into Twitter brawls because it's <laughs> fun. Okay. Um, no, I just, you know, I heard, I saw them uh, um, talking about about the fact that, you know, the purists were up in arms, making it known that not having a 100% jazz lineup means that jazz is dead and this lineup is holding the bat and beating it to death. Oh, and, Lord. and I think I think that's kind of silly. I had to jump in to say that soul music, hip hop are all cousins of jazz and inviting cousins to the party, to the cookout, to the vibes. That's what jazz is all about. And that's what it's always been about. Hey, can I ask you, if you're headed to a jazz festival, what's what's your strategy? What do you look for? How do you plan your time at a jazz festival? Um, first of all, like we said earlier, I love an outdoor show. So if yes. I can vibe with people outdoors and we're having a communal experience under the stars or in the hot, hot sun, I'm about that. So I look to see who's on the outdoor s- stages. And then I like to see who is buzzing? Like who is opening for who? Like the fact that Herbie Hancock has Domi and JD Beck, those are names that you should know, um, opening for him um, in, in Montreal. That's, you know, I look at that and think, oh my gosh, what a pairing. The legends and the future together. Yes, let's go. So just do some research. Listen, when you tell me that that's a name I should know, I'm going to listen. I appreciate please, that. Please Garvia, do. thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure, Elamine. Garvia Bailey is co-founder of the production company Media Girlfriends. She was speaking about her love of jazz and why so many jazz festival lineups include other artists from other genres as also a part of their lineups. And that is it for the show today. Hey, by the way, we're doing a Samantha Irby book giveaway on Instagram right now. Maybe you had a chance to hear my chat with her yesterday. If you haven't, I highly recommend you do. But if you want to win the entire set of all her books, including her latest book, Quietly Hostile, you just got to tag a friend and answer the question, what makes you quietly hostile? For example, I'm quietly hostile, but the fact that season two of The Bear isn't coming to Canada for like another month, I'm mad about it. Go check out our Instagram. We are at CommotionCBC. My name is Elamine Abdul-Mahmoud. See you tomorrow.